Good morning, everyone, and welcome. It's good to see you all this cool Sunday morning. Uh, if you are just coming in, there's a handout by the coffee pot. There's coffee by the coffee pot, which is uh, just as important, and I'm glad to be together. Those of you joining online, we're glad that you're here. Welcome. It's good that we are able to be together even when we are apart. If you're in the space, and I'll try to remember to do this again at the end, though sometimes when we run out of time, I forget to circle back around, you'll see three boards up front. Um, a group of individuals has been dreaming and wondering what St. Paul's will do with our property, particularly what used to be the Bassett Law Firm, the two buildings that face College Avenue. You might have read about that in the newsletter or been a part of an adult forum. But this is kind of some thoughts and some plans and there's a survey that we would love for you to complete. You can complete a digital copy of that survey, but if QR codes and links are uh, not easy for you, there is a paper copy of that survey. But we would love to hear from you um, what you imagine God is calling us to do with those resources um, and look forward to a conversation on the first Sunday in November. So about four weeks from today, but we'd love to hear from you before then. Uh, so if you'd like, when you're finished, uh, uh, take a look at those boards and consider the survey. Um, would somebody be willing to run the microphone around the room for us, please? Who might do that for us, pretty please? Elizabeth said she'll do that. Thank you, Elizabeth. Let's start with a prayer, and then we'll dig into our question about place. I'm going to put on the screen the same thing that's on your handout. I'm going to zoom in so that's easier to see. And this is a prayer for travelers, though I think there's a connection uh, at home. There's a handout by the coffee pot if you want one. Um, but let's read this prayer at the top of the page and the top of the screen together. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, whose glory fills the whole creation and whose presence we find wherever we go, Preserve those who travel from their homes. Surround them with your loving care. Protect them from every danger. And bring them in safety to their journey's end. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So just a reminder, we're talking about the theology of place. I think place matters. I think place matters a lot. Um, I think when we can't get to the place we need to go, it can create incredible anxiety and stress, uh, emotional and relational conflict. Um, when we can't get out of the place where we need to leave, the same is true. Um, we've talked about land of promise using some biblical imagery for, um, for the Levant, Palestine. Uh, we've talked about holy ground, what makes some places holier than others. We've talked about worship space, whether that's a structure like ours or the temple or perhaps another shrine. Today we're going to talk about homecoming, the concept of returning after a time away. Uh, next week we will interrupt our series for the Tippy Lecture. Chief Standing Bear will be with us and he will have wonderful things to say and I bet you'll sense a connection with what we've already been discussing. And then we'll come back and talk about someplace new. What comes after this life after this world. But let's start with just some opening questions. And I love this question. I ask it of a lot of groups. If you could go anywhere in the world, money's not an issue, logistics aren't an issue, but you had to leave tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. If you could go anywhere in the world, but you had to leave tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, where would you go? And if you want to tell us a little bit about why, I'd love to hear it. Where would you go? And if you've got an answer, raise your hand so the microphone can come and find you, and then we can all hear you, both in, in the room and also at home. Where would you go? I would go to Rabaul, which is on the eastern edge of New Britain, north of New Guinea and Australia. Yeah. Uh, it's a harbor, natural harbor. It's a volcanic crater, and there's an active volcano that um, spits out a lot of ash every 30 years or so. So the town is very small, and I think it's probably the single most beautiful place on Earth. Mm. Thank you. Where else would you go? Nine o'clock tomorrow morning. Wake up, hit the road. Where are you going? Yeah. I would go to Puglia, Italy, which is the actual boot heel. Yeah, thank you. Puglia. And pretty much anywhere in there. Yeah, thank you. Where would you go? 
Yeah, Adam. I would visit Korea. Mm, Korea. That's some place I've always wanted to go. Yeah, thank you. Where else? I, um, parts of India are on my list of places I would like to go. I don't think I'm ready to go tomorrow. Um, I think if I had to go somewhere tomorrow, I might go, I might just get in the car and drive north, like head towards Minneapolis in that general direction. And what about you? Where would you go? Tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock, money's not an issue, work's not an issue. Where would you go? Anywhere you want to be tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock? Some of you, yeah, James up here, and some of y'all, uh, Gabi and some others are, are going to head on pilgrimage um, to walk the Camino de Santiago, not Monday, but about a week from Monday, so that's, that's coming close. Yeah, James. I'd go to Los Angeles to see my mom. Los Angeles to see your mom. What a great answer. Yeah, anybody else? Yeah, all the way across. Yeah. Well, you beat me to uh, the um, uh, India just because it's so exotic and mm. as people growing up in Western civilization, we almost forget that there's another whole point of view and, and uh, history than our own. But just right off the top of my head to that, Tibet. Tibet. The, Him the Himalayas, you know, I love the outdoors and where else yeah. better than the top of the world. Yeah, thank you. All right, think about the last time you went on a long trip, a long trip. Um, maybe it was one trip, maybe it was a series of trips, but a time that you spent away. If you're on an extended trip, what are the signs to you that, that help you know it's time to go home? Like, what are the things that you experience or think of, or is there any anxiety or worry? Like, how do you know that it's time to go home? Yeah. When I went with my mother to England, after two weeks, I missed the smell of the sage chaparral of Southern California, where I lived at the time. Yeah, yeah. Smells are really important. They link our memories and places, yeah. How else? What about you? How do you know it's time to go home? Yeah, Haley, right behind you. There are handouts by the coffee pot. If you missed them, you're welcome to get one. It's the same thing on the screen. Yes, Haley. No matter how relaxing the trip is, I'm very, very tired. Yeah. Tired. Is home a place that you can be restored and rested in a way that traveling doesn't usually allow? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Isn't it funny? Sometimes we go on trips to relax. Like we go somewhere, we don't go and see lots of things or do lots of things. We go to a place to just sit, and yet still, there's a particular kind of fatigue that I experience that can only be resolved when I'm at home. Yeah. What about, what about you? What else? Yeah, Molly. Uh, Adam and then Molly. Thank you. Um, when all my clothes are dirty and all my stuff is disorganized, and I just feel like leaving it behind and leaving, like I don't even want to pack it up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, there's, who was it? We, Elizabeth, was it... Um, is it Jane Gearhart that travels with clothes she gives away? Y'all know Jane Gearhart? Anyway, whenever she travels, she takes clothes that she can just leave. She didn't want to pack it back. Anyway, yeah, Molly. I miss my routines. I want to get lonely yeah. after the kind of the sexiness wears off. Yeah. And, um, and then just, like, I don't have my hobbies. I don't have my routine. I don't have my chickens. I don't yeah. have my, you know, my life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How else? Yeah, Sarah. Um, I start to I start to think I recognize people that I actually don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which which is a, yeah. like you know that they're not that people. So so you think that that just your heart. There's something about your heart telling you a truth. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have amazing neighbors who take care of all of our pets and have for the 12 years we've lived here. And they're always excited, and the kids take care of them. But I can, we're anxious to see our pets. And they're, the stories are, well, there was this little thing. It was no big deal. And you can just tell yeah. It's, yeah. everybody's ready for yeah. everybody to get home. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, speaking of that, when, I, when we travel with children, usually the most presenting thing that tells me it's time to go home is just the children's demeanor. I mean, it doesn't matter how fun or exciting the trip is. They, they're not as pleasant to be with at some point, and that means it's time to go home because like, you can kind of almost forget about them when you're at home, but you can't when you're traveling. So yeah, yeah, for me, it's children that often present that, yeah. Anybody else want to share that experience of how you know it's time to go home? 
Has anybody ever needed or wanted to go home but couldn't? You don't have to tell us the story if it's... Anybody ever experienced an, the inability to go home? Yeah, yeah. I had a couple of moments like that, um, particularly when I was living overseas, and there was any sort of crisis at home. Um, a hurricane, I lived in England, a hurricane came and hit close to where my parents lived. It didn't matter to me that it wasn't right where my parents lived. It didn't matter to me that it didn't do any significant damage. Like I could not, my heart could not be where I was physically. I had to go home, I had to book a flight, I had to get there. Um, uh, and, and every minute that it took me to get there was really agonizing. Um, maybe you've had a, a similar experience. Sometimes we just need to get home. Sometimes we don't want to go home. Sometimes we can't go home. Um, I want to talk about home as a place and a concept, uh, partly in anticipation two weeks from today. We're going to talk about someplace new and a kind of a new home, a new heaven and a new earth. But I've got two stories for you, and I will tell you that when I picked this series, I think right after I got back from sabbatical, this sounded like such a great series, um, and, and I picked these lessons because they were on my mind, and I read them to you know last night thinking, huh, I'm not sure that's what I wanted to talk about. So I trust the Holy Spirit works in ways that are beyond my, uh, my knowing or ability. So let's listen to these scripture lessons and think, do we really mean to read those or, um, or not? I, I bet we'll find something in there. But who would read for us? The first lesson is from 2 Samuel. And some of y'all have been in the Monday Bible study with me and you've heard this lesson recently. Um, but let's listen to this story and, uh, and maybe I'll fill in some of the details and then we'll talk about home. Who's, Adam, are you reading it? Thanks. I got the mic already. Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> My dad went to high school in a city called Hebron, Nebraska. So that's Oh, great. Let me... At the end of four years, Absalom said to the king, please let me go to Hebron so I can fulfill a promise I made to the Lord. Your servant made this promise when I lived in Geshur in Aram. I promised that if the Lord would bring me back to Jerusalem, then I would worship the Lord in Hebron. Go in peace, the king said. So Absalom left and went to Hebron. But Absalom sent secret agents through the, throughout the tribes of Israel with this message. When you hear the sound of the trumpet, then say, Absalom has become king in Hebron. Two hundred invited guests went with Absalom from Jerusalem. They were innocent and knew nothing of this matter when they went. While Absalom was offering the sacrifices, he summoned David's advisor, Ahith Ahithophel, who was from Gilo, to come from his hometown. So the conspiracy grew stronger, and Absalom's following grew. A messenger came to David, reporting, the, harps of the, the hearts of the Israelites have gone over to Absalom. Then David told all the servants who were with him in Jerusalem, Come on, we have to run for it, or we won't be able to escape Absalom. Hurry, or he will catch up with us in no time, destroy us, and attack the city with the sword. The king's servants said to him, Your servants are ready to do whatever our master the king decides. So the king left, and with, with his entire household following him. But he left ten secondary wives behind to take care of the palace. So the king left, with all his people following him, and they stopped at the last house. All the king's servants marched past him, as did all the Cherethites, all the Pelethites, and the 600 Gittites who had followed him from Gath. The king said to Ittai the Gittite, Why are you coming with us too? Go back. Stay with King Absalom. You are a foreigner and an exile from your own country. You just got here yesterday. So today, should I make you wander around with us while I go wherever I have to go? No. Go back and take your relatives with you. May the Lord show you loyal love and faithfulness. But Ittai answered the king, As surely as the Lord lives, and as surely as my master the king lives, wherever my master the king may be, facing death or facing life, your servant will be there too. Okay then, David replied to Ittai, keep marching. So Ittai the Gittite and all of his men and all the little children with him marched past. The whole countryside cried loudly as all the troops marched past. The king crossed the Kidron Valley and all the troops passed by on the Olive Road into the wilderness. Zadok was there too, along with all the Levites carrying the chest containing God's covenant. They set God's chest down and Abiathar offered sacrifices until all the troops had finished marching out of the city. Then the king said to Zadok, carry God's chest back into the city. 
If the Lord thinks well of me, then he will bring me back and let me see it and its home again. But if God says, I'm not pleased with you, then I am ready. Let him do to me whatever pleases him. Do you understand, the king said to the priest Zadok, go back to the city in safety, you and Abiathar and your two sons, your son Ahimaaz and Abiathar's son Jonathan. I will be waiting in the desert plains until you send word telling me what to do. So Zadok and Abiathar took God's chest back to Jerusalem and stayed there. Thank you, Adam. Some of y'all remember this part of the biblical narrative. Let me add a couple of details to kind of help us understand. This is David, King David, and his opponent at this point is his son Absalom. You might remember that Absalom fled the city of Jerusalem because he murdered uh, David's other son, the firstborn son, um, and so he knew that uh, his own life was in danger. But after a while, because of some political instability, um, David decided to bring Absalom back, and for four years, Absalom lived in Jerusalem, but didn't have a repaired relationship with David. And at the beginning of this chapter, which we skipped, um, Absalom is winning the hearts of the people because David seems to not be attentive to his duties as king. So as the story starts, we've got Absalom, David's son, who is leading a rebellion, um, an insurrection against his father David to take the throne. And we see David, when he gets word of this, he flees. And then we saw a couple of interactions, one with uh, Ittai the Gittite and one with uh, the priests. Um, I want to talk about those interactions as we think about what does it mean to be at home or to anticipate returning home. But let's start with Ittai. That first question on your handout, Ittai the Gittite, um, what, does the, what does his role in the story teach us about home? Do you, did, you, did you pick up on what happened to Ittai the Gittite? Let me, let me, um, let me scroll up a little bit, right? Um, let me see, there we go. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the king left and, and um, the king said, Ittai the Gittite, why are you coming to, with us too? Right, um, go, go back. What, what, what is it about this exchange with Ittai the Gittite that what does it teach us about where home is to be found and our connection with home? Any thoughts about that? You might be asking, yeah, Sarah. Or maybe a, another way to say that as we wait for Sarah is, are there any words or phrases about, from that part of the story that, that make you wonder about home? But yeah, start with, start with you, Sarah. Home is not a place, actually. Yeah. It's a person. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Um, yeah, yeah, right. Go, you know, um, yeah. David says, go back and take your relatives with you. And that test says, wherever my master, uh, there your servant will be there too. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, what's up? I mean, it comes on my uh, uh, Pandora feed all the time, um, a song that there's a line sort of, home is, home is where I am with you, right, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but did you, I mean, notice how, notice how the story goes even further. Um, David says, look, you just got here yesterday. Like, you and all your people have been living in suitcases we don't know where we're going to go. Don't look. Go, go and rest. Go and stay here. You don't. You don't need to follow me. That'll be miserable. Nobody wants to extend that journey by so much. Did you notice in verse nineteen what David says? Stay with King Absalom, as if David has already yielded the throne to his son. So there's a sense. Not only is he saying that for Ittai's sense, but also David might not be sure either. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ray. He might, he might be testing Etai's loyalty. Could be, for sure. Absolutely. There could be a test. Often there are tests in there. Given how, um, given how depressed David has seen the last few chapters, like I'm not sure I, I trust that David could even have that in him. I, I think he's, he's, if you read the story, he's, uh, he's lost at this point. Yeah. What else does Etai tell us about home? Think about, think about ethnicity and family, right? Um, like where, where, do you, where do your people where are your people from? Right? We might say that in a southern context. Where are your people from? Right? I grew up in Alabama. Both of my parents were born in Fayette, or lived in their childhood years in Fayette, Alabama, sort of west, northwestern Alabama. But my mother's family is from um, Tennessee and, and Virginia. My father's family is from uh, Escambia County, Alabama, and over from the Delta in Mississippi. Um, I've never lived in any of those places, yet maybe you would say my people are from there. Um, if, you, if you've lived in a place where your family has been for generations, maybe you've experienced that differently from, uh, from, uh, from my experience. But what, 
what does it mean to dwell in a place where the people are your people? And, and, and can we get past um, not only last names, but also culture and ethnicity and traditions and begin to identify with the people that aren't our own? It, Itai, Itai the Gittite, I mean, he's, he's not Jewish. He's a foreigner. He's a foreigner, right? Um, and yet, yet he's able to attach home not only to place, but to David. What does that tell us? What, what's your experience of a home being uh, uh, attributed to a, a tribe? Any, any reflections on that? People who talk like us? Yeah. Yeah. All my life, people have said, you don't sound like you're from Alabama. And it just, it kind of cuts a little bit. What do you mean I don't sound like, that's where I'm from. What do you, what do you want me to say? I mean, do I need to prove, do you want to see, like, you know, the, the, the power bills from my family's house for the last 35 years? I mean, you know, um, when someone doesn't recognize you as belonging to this community, that can, that can be hard, yeah? Well, let me ask the second question. Um, did you notice at the end of the story what David says to the priests? Right, Zadok, um, Zadok and Abiathar the priest, they set God's chest down. Remember the Ark of the Covenant? Think Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? Just let all of Steven Spielberg's imagination fill this moment. Right, And so if we take this chest, this ark, into battle, God himself will be with us. God himself will be with us. God will help us be victorious. The priests know what they're supposed to do. The king has marched out. We've got to take the ark with us. But David stops them and says, what? Go back. Take it back into the city. What is, what's David telling us? Whether he means it or not. What's the significance of David saying to the priests, Take the chest, take the ark back into the city, verse 25. If the Lord thinks well of me, then he will bring me back and let me see it and its home again. But if God says, I'm not pleased with you, eh, I'm ready. Let God do whatever God pleases. What, what's the significance of David's, of the ark going back? Yeah, Ray? This problem with Absalom is a transient situational disturbance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who wants to unpack that for us? Yeah, or, you know, or say more about, the, about what's going on. So what, a, a transient disturbance. What does it mean? What, if you wanted to interpret David's understanding of home, what, 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 kind of, what, kind of, um, what kind of understanding of place and home is David offering us in this moment? What's he telling us about his own mind? Yeah. I don't, I don't know if I can answer that. That's okay. But what I'm, what I'm hearing from David is I'm not the key player here. Yeah. That God is the key player and what, whether I'm there or not is not significant. It's it's what God's will is going to be. And yeah. so he's just submitted to that in a way that he is not seeing himself as the, the everything rises or falls on me, yeah. which is not always intuitive for David. Yeah, no, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. Thank you for that insight. Let me ask, let me springboard that and ask the group, is it easier or harder for you to trust that you're not the center of the universe when you're home? Is home a place where it's easier for you to kind of trust that the world is bigger than that, or is home a place where that gets harder? I, I think it depends on our experience of home, right? Um, what do you think? Think about that. I think it's pretty remarkable that David leaves town at all. I think it's pretty remarkable that he leaves town and kind of doesn't, ex doesn't expect to go back. Maybe, maybe he does. It depends on how you read into the text. But I think it's... David's life is saved because he's willing to get up and go, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, building on what Lisa was saying, I, I think sometimes when we leave, we have more of an appreciation of what home is. Mm. We can see it better. Yeah. And I think, yeah, it seems like David sees the, the cultural and community value of maintaining the integrity of his home. Yes, and... This is how the story gets told to us, right? The narrator wants us to see that and experience that, right? It's not an accident. This, I mean, 
it's going to turn out that the priests are going to be like spies for David. So the narrative is actually going to use them in a helpful way. Um, I don't think, I think David's just barely starting to get a sense of that at the last verse that we read, or the last two. I'll be waiting in the desert plains until you tell me what to do, right? We're, if you keep reading, it's kind of an aha moment where it all starts to come together again. But I think even more than that, the narrator, that the story wants the reader, even thousands of years later, to kind of wrestle with David and, and, and ex- experience that kind of turning, yeah, that, that, that faithfulness. Even if David didn't realize it at the time, it was, still, it was still an opportunity to discover that. We're discovering it with him, yeah. Yeah, what else? Anything else that you would say about, about David and his, his ability, or maybe not ability, or maybe it's coincidence, I don't know, um, but the, the fact that he's able to tell them to take the ark back, it belongs in Jerusalem. It belongs in Jerusalem. If I come back, that'll be fine. If I don't come back, you'll, it'll, it'll all work out for y'all. Yeah, isn't that a remarkable thing? I find home a hard, like my childhood home, a hard place to experience that. Like, I don't know about you, but when I go home, I become the 17-year-old that I was when I lived there. And, and we see this a lot, especially during funerals. When siblings come back together, we all fall right back into the roles that we had when we were kids. You know, the oldest tells everybody what to do, and the youngest rolls her eyes at it, right? I mean, we, like, we, like, we know, right? Um, there's something about that. And if, if we've gained any kind of insight, the kind of insight that David's inviting us to see, then maybe we're set free from that, that cycle. And it's not just us. It's, it's the house. It's the smell. It's our parents. It's the memory of our parents, Right? It's the memory of what our brother did to us when we were four years old and, and mama wasn't looking, right? You know, just you know, beating up on us all the time, right? It's, all that comes flooding back. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you think David expects to go back? I mean, we don't know. We, we, we see some evidence there, but in, in your imagination, in your, in your telling of the story, if you were giving the actor in this movie insights, would you tell the actor playing David, look, you... You've got to know you're going to come back. You've got to hope that. Or do you say to the actor, I want you to deliver these lines wondering genuinely if you'll ever see this holy city again. How do you, how do you hear that? And, and what's the cost? Haley, what's the cost? So when I read this, it sounds like he's still really depressed and he's really tired and he just do- doesn't have very much fight left in him. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so... What do you think? He doesn't even, he's not even able to think about it, not even able to wonder? Yeah. yeah, yeah. What else? Adam, next door. Sorry, I should have just... <laughs> it's like he's like, this is not how I saw my life panning out. Yeah. But, you know, we have a chronicle of David's whole life. There's a lot of things in, in you know, before this event that are also kind of surprises. And, and so he's letting God... Let it, letting himself just sort of be led and not really making a lot of decisions. Yeah. But yeah. I don't know. I don't know what it could go either way on whether he thinks he's going to be back or not. Yeah. Yeah. In Bible study, we talked about this. Like David, David's a, a decent king. He gets celebrated for his identity, his faithfulness. He's a really bad father. He's really bad. His, his oldest child has been killed. Uh, and if you go back and read the story, he probably knew it was coming and didn't do anything about it. Um, and he doesn't know how to be reconciled with this, one of the sons that le- that's left, Absalom. I mean, you know, uh, uh, you, you can't be king and not know what's going on. You can't know that your son is stealing the hearts of the nation away from you, and yet David's a, a, a seemingly oblivious. Um, like, he's just stuck. He's really bad at that. He gets hooked by his inability to, to be differentiated from his children. It's, he's stuck. Um, yeah, and... And I think in some ways, home for him is a place of unresolved conflict. Yeah. Well, what's he supposed to do? Is he supposed to kill Absalom that killed his other son? I mean, doesn't, isn't he waiting for things to, you know, to kind of play out? And isn't he giving Absalom enough rope to hang his, hang his, own, good, hang his own self? Good question. Good question. I wonder if not... Um, I think part of his guilt is you might remember that... Um, Amnon played the, the trick on, on, asked David for permission to go take care of his daughter and then raped his daughter, um, uh, David's daughter, Ab, uh, Amnon's half-sister, Absalom's full sister. Um, and, 
and then Absalom responded by killing Amnon, and, and David didn't interject himself and both, like, failed to act the first time. I think, I think David dealing with a lot of his own guilt, not just his anger at, at, at Absalom, but sometimes when we're frustrated at our own inability to act, it just becomes easier to be angry at somebody else. But he can't even clarify that. It's a mess. It's a big mess. Yeah, who's, yeah Robin. Um, he did know that all of his children will, would uprise against him because God told him that when he took Bathsheba. Yes. I think that's where he was told by Nathan. Yes. That, uh, your memory of that's better than your mine. Your house will, right, well, you'll always have your Conflict children. will never leave your house. Your children yeah. or yeah. your house rising against yeah. you. Yeah. So yeah. he knew, but he, he loved them, but um, he didn't know how to love them in a way that was more, things would turn out better. Sure. I mean, we could say the same thing for Jacob. Right, Jacob and, and his 12 sons. Yeah. All right, let's read the next story. And then um, it's a, a different sense of home and not really a happy homecoming. Who would read this bit from Matthew 13 for us, pretty please? Thank you, James up front. And the CEB uses some different language for us, so if something surprises you, that's okay. Um, yeah, thank you, James. When Jesus came to his hometown, he taught the people in the synagogue. They were surprised and said, Where did you get this wisdom? Where did you get this power to work miracles? Isn't he the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother named Mary? Aren't James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas his brothers? And his sisters, aren't they here with us? Where did this man get all this? They were repulsed by him and fell into sin. But Jesus said to them, Prophets are honored everywhere but in their hometowns and their own households. He was unable to do very many miracles there because of their disbelief. Thank you. What? You know, every time I hear the story, I'm, I'm, I'm both surprised and not surprised. You know, one of those things that's like, like you, you know it's coming, and yet it still kind of hits you, like, really? Um, what, what about you? What's your experience of his hometown's uh, the, the people's reaction. Are you surprised by their reaction? Are you not surprised by their reaction? And, and, and how, do you, how, do you, how do you experience that? Tell us why. Why are you surprised or not surprised? Yeah, Adam? When I was first starting to get into like a career, I wanted to be the assistant program director of the camp that I grew up going to. And the executive director has, had known me the whole time. And so he was like very wary. He's like, I don't know. And I was like, why? I, I love this camp. And, and now I get it. Like, I'm, and I'm you know, totally mortified that anyone had to know me when I was 14. Um, but I get, they're like, this, the, Jesus, you know, the guy that we've watched grow up is now like wants to teach us stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Who else? Are you surprised or not surprised when you hear the crowd's rejection of Jesus and the basis for it? What do you think? Yeah, Sarah. I'm not surprised because um, he, you know, he's outside of their pattern. <laughs> he's outside yeah. of what they're expecting, and I, you know, you see this in in. Well, you were mentioning it, but I remember in, in hiring people, uh, people would, like, we would have this fantastic candidate from here in Fayetteville who was amazing, and yet the powers that be wanted to hire this person from New York City who, had, yeah. who was exactly the same qualifications. Yeah. Um, and it just, it, it ha there's this exoticism that, is okay, but if you're from here and you're amazing, it's not okay. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I always focus on the fact that they knew him well. You invite me to think about the fact that sometimes we want something we don't know just because it's different and new. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is the Messiah? Like, this kid my kid grew up with? I mean, I knew he was special, but surely, surely, surely not, right? Yeah. Yeah. What else do you notice? I think it's interesting how Matthew tells this story. Luke tells a similar version of the story 
where he goes to the synagogue and reads and everybody thinks he's great, but then he challenges them with his interpretation of Isaiah and they try to throw him off a cliff. Um, but but Matthew, Matthew gives us this litany of identifications, right? Carpenter's son, mother named Mary, James, Joseph, and Simon, Judas' his brothers. Sisters, aren't they here with us? It's like Matthew wants us to know that the basis of their rejection is their knowledge of him. And the, quick, the, the, the rapidity with which they reject Jesus is proportional to their knowledge about him. Why? Why is it? Why is it? Why is it we, that they, that we have a hard time receiving someone like this? Why is it that a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown or in his, home, his own home? Why? Why is that human nature? Ooh, because we don't feel good about ourselves. Huh. Huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So kind of a, just a self-deprecating, just like a, a low, low self-esteem. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know... Um, it's the person that you graduate from high school or college with who goes on to be a great success that only makes you feel like a real failure, right? You know, it's okay if it's from somebody, somebody else's town, but like by comparison, we, we play the comparison game, right? Yeah, yeah. Is she really smarter? Is she really that much better than I am, smarter than I am, you know, hardworking than I am? Yeah, all the way across. <laughs> Well, we have preconceived notions about individuals that maybe we've known all of our life, and they surprise us when they, when they yeah. do these things. We didn't know really the, their capabilities because we didn't know them as well as we thought they might. Yeah, that makes, me, that makes me wonder whether we knew them at all or whether we just thought we knew them or we, we, we put them into a box, right? We put people in boxes all the time, right? Yeah, yeah. And we think we know, but we don't. How do we get, how, do, how are we freed from that? Whether it's in a hiring situation or in a relational situation. Um, you know, your, your, your daughter or son uh, falls in love with someone that you just can't stand. How, how are you going to get over that, right? Um, yeah, huh. Um, I'm fascinated with verse 58. Theologically, I don't have an answer, but I'd love to hear what you think. Why was Jesus unable to do miracles in that community because of, that he didn't fit their expectations. What's the relationship between Jesus' ability and the attitude of the people he's around? Do you, does it work like that, Haley? Maybe the sick people didn't even want to go to him. Oh, so maybe they weren't even asking, or they didn't even know to ask. Or, they, or yeah. you know, they're like, yeah, okay, whatever. Like, yeah. I, don't, I don't believe that. I'm not yeah. going to go try to get healed by that quack. Yeah. Does anybody, has anybody ever had as their own physician a high school friend? I, I haven't, but I wonder. Mm. Right, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Liz, Liz, did you have something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it's really hard to be any kind of leader, whether that be a physician, a spiritual leader, or whatever, if your own people don't have faith in you. Yeah, but even Jesus... Even Jesus, yeah, that's, because that's, he grew up yeah. ordinary, and they felt like he was ordinary. And why was he the one that was chosen and not me? That's what they're thinking, I think. Yeah. So I, I'm not asking just you, but, but I, you're right. I mean, yes, the text says that. Would we say that God, God can only help us if we believe it? No, we wouldn't say that, right? And yet, how do we participate in our own help, our own healing, if... If, we're, uh, if we can't give our heart to it. Yeah, like I'm being, I want to, I think the psychology of, of this moment is, is powerful. Yeah, Robin. Yeah, I, I used to believe that you had to have faith to be healed. I don't, I don't really have that stance anymore, except mm. I feel like I need to be, have my heart open for God to do something that I'm wanting or asking. Yeah. But if I'm not, then... I'm sort of blocking it in a way. I think you could block blessings or, or miracles like that. Yeah. We've got several physicians in the room by chance. Um, I'm curious, or, or Kara, have, have you ever experienced a, a patient's lack of confidence or lack of, of trust having an effect on their outcomes? I don't know if you've ever, if you've ever experienced that. But anyway, I, and I'm not asking you to tell this, but I, you know, just... I, w I wonder, from a, from a healing perspective, I wonder, 
I wonder if you can tell that someone's psychology or willingness to give themselves to a moment has an effect on the outcome. Yeah. Anyway, Aaron. Yeah, my, my assumption is that in this small town, there are probably just a handful of families. And what I think of are, is sort of the, the uh, uh, toxic family dynamic that comes out when one of its members does something good. They say, okay, yeah. that was cool, but you could have done better. You yeah. know, that's, that, that, that's what comes <laughs> to my mind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've heard that before. And, interesting, verse 57, um, they were repulsed by him and fell into sin, which is an odd way to translate that. Um, the, the Greek word is uh, scandal, like scandal. They were scandalized by him, which is a word that we use to say f- fell into sin and, and repulsed. That, like, that's a fair translation. It usually gets translated stumbled. Um, uh, some translations will, say, will attach explicit sin language. But they were scandalized by him. That helps me a little bit uh, understand the relationship between the crowd's reaction and, and Jesus' ability to, to do anything. Yeah, yeah, Robin. And then we'll finish with our concluding question. Yeah. Um, Hadn't they seen quite a few self-proclaimed messiahs and miracle workers come and go? And so they might have had, wanting to have discernment too, that, well, here's another one. Let's see how this goes. Now, as far as going to his town and he can't heal, that's sort of a different issue. They were from Nazareth, right? So was yes. it where he went, that yeah. town was looked down upon really bad, and those people were probably looking down upon themselves. Yeah. And they're like, he's from Nazareth. What? Yeah. You know. Yeah, it's funny, though. Usually I feel, I feel rejected or repulsed by someone who assumes I don't know them. You're not from around here. What do you know about, what do you know about my journey? Right? In, in some ways, the irony is it's the opposite. Like, we know him too much. He knows, he knows too much about us. Um, yeah. Um, take a look at the just concluding questions. Things for us to think about. Like, think about what happens to you when you go back home. And I don't mean the home you live in now. I mean the home where you grew up. Whether that's the physical place, sometimes that's enough, or the people you're with, like th- Thanksgiving's coming up. Some of us are going to be back home. Some of us would love to go back home, but we can't. Others of us sort of have to steal our nerves in order to survive that. Um, what happens to us when we return home? Um, what, what is awakened within us when we return home? Um, and and what, what, almost like David, or perhaps like Jesus and his uh, companions, what might we realize happens within us as we come home? Yeah, James, response to that. Yeah. So I actually recently did this, probably about a year and a half ago because I grew up in a little town named Alliance, Ohio, and I left home to come here and work for Walmart. And I had gotten a degree in computer science, and so when you return home, you're kind of wondering if you're going to meet the expectations mm. of those who you return home to. So, yeah. you know, you've left home, you went to get a job, and then you, you know, did you meet their expectations? Yeah. You know, what you grew up, you know, you grew up as this type of person, are you meeting your um, expectations of your friends and your family? Yeah. And, you know, you dearly hope that you do. Yeah. N- even before anybody opens their mouth, we feel that when we walk into town, right? We feel that even before anybody says anything to us. I mean, usually when I see a friend in the grocery store, they don't say, oh, have you, have you made out well with your life? Or are you still stuck in that, right? But, but just seeing them, you know, you know, sometimes they'll say things like, oh, you've gained a lot of weight. And I'm like, you Sure. It's all mental. Anyway, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all mental. Like yeah, it's yeah. all in your head. Yeah, it's all in our heads, right? Yeah. 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 What else? Anybody else want to share what happens? Yeah, Susan. What if you never left? Right? Yeah. I never have. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, I actually wasn't born in Fayetteville, but I've lived here since I was six months old. And there is some comfort in the connecting of dots. Uh, within families and understanding that and um, some people are better at that than others some people don't care you know it's not important for them to know that Um, so there is that I guess positive but on the other hand it's always like well why didn't you leave you know you had the opportunity you know why did you choose or what were the circumstances that you stayed? And so it, I always kind of feel a little, I mean, I, it's almost like I felt the opposite of Jesus, 
you know, like in his situation, not being able to perform, it's sort of like sometimes I feel like I can't perform because I've been here and I'm not worldly enough. Yeah. Okay, that's the word I yeah, really yeah. want. Enough. I'm not yeah. worldly enough to yeah. uh, be able to enter into these conversations. And this is ex um, in this community particularly, um, because it's an academic community, there is that whole, you know, if you don't leave and go get your degree somewhere else, then you're not going to be accepted with yeah. that within that academic community. And that's, that is a real thing. It's sort of a patriarchal thing, I do believe. I will put that out there, but it's, um, it still exists. I'm, I'm, I want to say that. Thank you. We don't have time for any more comments, um, but I'll leave you with um, that second question which is, what does it take for us to learn to be as thankful for the coming home as the going away? And how can we sort of hold those things in perspective? How does some clarity around what happens to us when we show back up at home or when we are, remain at home, how does that clarity help us discover that place is significant, but, but maybe, it's not, maybe it's not everything? Uh, come back next week for the Tippy McMichael lecture and then the week after for our final session. Good to be with you all. Thank you. <laughs>